We are in Isaiah 25 this morning, and it may seem like a big shift from talking about that to talking about the prophet Isaiah from many thousands of years ago. But it's not so much, and it's, I'll bring a, an illustration to bear from Charles Spurgeon, one of the great English preachers uh, that ever lived. And he used to speak about how the chapters of the Old Testament are like little towns and villages in a great kingdom. And every little town and village has a little footpath that leads to a byway, that leads to a highway, that leads to the capital city, which leads to the king. And so every chapter, every section in the Old Testament points to what? It points to the gospel, and it points to the salvation of Jesus. It points to the Messiah to come. And we're going to see direct, clear evidence of this this morning. But this gospel that we proclaim now, it was the same hope that Isaiah proclaimed in the past, that there would be a Messiah to come, and that death would be overcome in that Messiah. And this is our hope, the hope that we continue to proclaim to the world today. So let's stand, please, to honor the Lord as we read his word, as we read Isaiah chapter 25 this morning. Isaiah chapter 25. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin, the foreigner's palace is a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. Verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged, of aged wine, well refined. And he will shallow, I'm sorry, he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab shall be trampled down in his place, as straw is trampled down in a dunghill. And he will spread out his hands in the midst as a swimmer spreads his hands to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hands and the high fortifications of his walls he will bring down, lay low and cast to the ground, to the dust. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. All right, well, let's walk through this chapter here this morning. I'm going to do my best to help you understand this and pray that it will be encouraging to you because there are some wonderful, wonderful things here this morning. Our passage, which comes after many chapters of proclamations of woes and destruction against the enemies of God, and the previous chapter speaks of judgment of the whole earth, we get to this place of what is going to happen at the end of this judgment. When the Lord brings all of his enemies under his feet, what is going to happen? And this chapter begins with a word of praise. O Lord, you are my God, which is a statement of allegiance. I pray that every one of you here may be able to say that, that you call the Lord not just the God or a God, but my God, that your allegiance is to the Lord and that you know him in a personal and real way. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. To exalt the Lord is to lift him up, is to make much, to hold him high above all others and especially above yourself and the praising of yourself. It's part of what we do here this morning, but it's part of what you do in your conversation every single day when you are interacting with people of the world. You will either say something about God and you will exalt his name or you will be silent about the Lord and say nothing about him. Here, Isaiah speaks of exalting the Lord and praising his name. 
honoring the name of the Lord, speaking well of him. Why? Why does he say these things? For you have done wonderful things, the second part of verse 1. Wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and true. I love that passage. These are not things that are happening in a way that are just sort of tumbling forward and, and it coming about by happenstance. Things that are surprising the Lord, that he's trying to shape as they, as they come about. That is not the case at all. Instead, the scriptures teach us clearly that God has had plans from before even the foundations of the world. And that his plans and his purposes are the things that are being worked out in the world. They are wonderful things. It is the plans of creation. It is the plans of formation of a people at this time the the people of Israel, a chosen nation, and then a plan of salvation, a plan to send a Savior, a Messiah, to complete and to take away the sins of the world. These are the wonderful plans of God, plans that are good, plans that are for your good and for mine. They are of old, they are faithful, and they are sure. You can bank on the promises of the Lord. The things that the Lord says will come to pass will in fact come to pass. We'll see later in this passage in verse 9 that the people have been waiting and continue to wait. And we'll see in many ways we are still waiting even though certain things have been completed. Still the word of the Lord is sure. Plans of old. We should look to the past works of God to give us confidence in the future works of the Lord. Here in the context of Isaiah, there had been many works of the Lord in the past to give the people encouragement to look forward to the future works of the Lord. We are in a privileged place of having even more of the past works of the Lord accomplished, giving us even more confidence for his completion in the future. But we need to see from verses like this that there is nothing arbitrary. There is no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as chance. There is no such thing as fortune. There is no happenstance of things coming about that were unknown to the Lord, unthought of by him, and unplanned of. Instead, there is providence. There is the good providence of God that is working out the issues of life. Well, the second verse is a statement about the Lord overcoming all of his enemies. Again, if we go back many, many chapters, all the way back to chapter 13, it's a long progression of the Lord stating how he is going to undermine the enemies of his people in Israel and Judah, from chapters 13 all the way to chapter 24. But here, it is a summary statement. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. All the enemies of the Lord will be cast down. You kind of hold on to that one because you're going to hear more about that this morning as we go to the New Testament and we see this thread that Isaiah starts continue to be pulled. No enemy will stand against the Lord. In chapter, I'm sorry, in verse 3, it goes on. And to say that not only will no enemy stand against the Lord, but in fact, ruthless enemies of the Lord will be what? They will be converted. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. That's a fascinating statement. That not only will the Lord take down the power of his enemies, but he will turn the hearts of people towards him. This is the idea that there will be people from every tongue and tribe and nation in glory one day. There will be people from every nation, all kinds of nations that hated and cursed the name of the Lord. And yet he works in the hearts to bring some of those to himself. That even though they come from a ruthless nation and are a strong people defying the Lord, he changes their hearts and brings some of them to himself. As the kingdom of God expands, people from all nations will be brought in. And then he turns to the poor and the needy. This is a constant, constant theme throughout the book of Isaiah where the Lord is always reminding the people of their duties to the poor and needy because of his care in his heart towards the poor and needy. It is a constant theme of the Lord caring for those that know that they need him and they need something. In God's salvation, he has particular care and concern for the needy. 
This is something that we're always pressing for in this church. We were just, uh, Paul just appealed last week about uh, a work crew. It's in, the, it's in the newsletter now. We have a very significant benevolence fund here. If you ever feel led to give to that, all of these things are us trying to do our best to care for those that are poor and needy and take up this theme that continues from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament that we ought to care for the poor, especially the poor that are in our midst. And so what does God say about the poor? He says this, For you have been, in verse 4, You have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress. The Lord as a stronghold. This is a safe place. People that are, that are poor and needy are often, they feel very exposed as if the world is going to overtake them and there's just nothing that they can do about it. It leads to a place of hopelessness. Where do we go in times like that? The first place that we go is to the Lord our God. He is described often in the scriptures as a stronghold, as a shield, a place when we have nothing to offer God, either spiritually or physically. We go to the Lord and he is a stronghold and shield for us, knowing what our needs are. He continues on. He is a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall. So when the things get hot, when you feel overwhelmed, the Lord is as a shade to us. When the ruthless come against us, he is like a wall between us and them. And this is for the poor and for the needy. But all of us will soon recognize that we fall into this camp. This is what Jesus did in his ministry. He focused his ministry on what type of people? The people that knew that they needed him. The people that knew they had needs. The people that were not proud and stiff in their hearts. But those in their weakness realized that they needed something from God. And this has always been the case. That those that are downtrodden, those that are crushed by the things of the world, are the first to call out to God because they know the great need that they have in their heart. And the Lord is always willing to hear them because of his special concern for them. Well, verses 1 through 5 relate to the time of Isaiah's time and the work of the Lord there as he begins to summarize these things. But verses 6 through the rest of the chapter go to the future and speaking about how God is going to accomplish his work, not only during the time of Isaiah, but as they look forward to the hope of a Messiah. Because what the Lord is going to bring about in the lifetime of Isaiah is not his final salvation. And as we're going to see, there's going to be an inauguration of this salvation in Christ, and then it's going to continue on until its full completion at the second coming of Christ. But in verse 6, we have a shift from the regular work of the Lord to the future work of the Lord. And he says, on this mountain, which is Mount Zion in Jerusalem, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a rich feast. Will is a forward-looking thing. In verse 6, he's going to talk about a feast. In verse 7, he's going to talk about the removal of a covering. Verse 8, about the swallowing up of death. In verse 9, the joy of waiting for the Lord. So he begins with this language of feasting. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. It's a picture of a glorious feast. And this is the beginning of language like this in the Bible. I'm going to write some more about this in the newsletter because I don't have time to get to it this morning. But Jesus carries on this language. He uses it in parables. He talks about calling the wayward, those in the highways and the byways, to come in to a feast, a wedding feast that he is going to prepare. And who makes excuses? Who do not come into that feast? The wealthy of the world, those that have all that they need, they make excuses. They have no interest in coming to this invitation that the Lord has granted. But we'll see in the end, in Revelation, there's something called the wedding feast of the Lamb. There's just one beautiful verse here, a little picture, something that's almost in a shadow that we don't really know what he is talking about, that Jesus talks about more and that is spoken of even more in the book of Revelation. And when Jesus is at the last supper with his disciples, where he says, I will not drink of this cup until we come together again in my kingdom. 
There is going to be a time of great feasting and joy in the kingdom of God. When as we're going to see, death is put behind us, the shame and sorrow of sin is put behind us, and all things are made new for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is a beautiful picture a rich feasting situation, a crowd, plenty, goodness, joy, gladness. This talk of wine and well-aged wine is not talk of drunkenness. It's talk of joy and people enjoying things together. But I would mention that those that say that there is no such, we should never ever partake of such things, you're going to have a hard time with the scriptures. Because Jesus spoke, Jesus created good wine for a wedding feast. He is going to serve this to us in heaven for the sake of joy and gladness together. And so there is a place for these things in moderation. But it's a joyful, beautiful picture of things that are yet to come. And it's meant to fill the people's hearts with hope. It's meant to fill your heart with hope this morning as to what God is doing and is going to continue doing. Verse 7 speaks about the swallowing up on this mountain of a covering cast over all people, a veil spread over all the nations. This is less clear. But in the language of God's final redemption of human beings, my understanding of this is the the veil cast over all people is the curse of sin over the world. All the world is covered by the curse of sin. It affects every single one of us every single day. And it will be with us until the Lord comes again. And he judges the world and brings to bear heaven, a new heaven and a new earth as the scriptures speak of. And in that time, this veil, this covering of sin upon the world will be removed. It will be no more. It's something that we all look forward to and long for. And this is hope, I believe, that Isaiah is speaking of in this passage. But verse 8 is going to be our focal point this morning. In this time, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people He will take away from all the earth. These are beautiful words, and they're going to appear again in the New Testament. We'll read them in a moment. But the words used in Scripture are important, and they matter. He's going to swallow up death, it says, forever. To swallow something is to ingest it, to take it into yourself to where it is done away with. There's no way at this point in time that these people could have understand, is understood what these words of the Lord meant. But we understand what it means for God in his own person to take death into his own body, to as, as it were to swallow it in his body that it is destroyed in his own person. Hold that thought because we're going to come back to it as Paul clarifies it in the New Testament. In this time, the Lord will take away the sorrow of death and pain. And it is so personal. He says, not only will he wipe away tears, which you could take as sort of a general concept of sad things being removed, but he will wipe away the tears from all faces. The Lord Jesus touched people in his ministry. He came to diseased people, struggling people, and he put his hands on them. And the idea of the Lord God wiping tears away from your face is an incredibly personal act of comfort from the Lord. That his care for you is to that extent. And that he is speaking these things to us that we might not lose heart in the struggle of pain and death in this world. But that we might understand there will come a time when death will be no more. And not only death, but the reproach of sin. The reproach of sin has to do with the shame of the conscience. And even when we know that we are forgiven of our sins, there is still the reproach of shame that is hard to shake. When we do things that we know we should never have done, but they mark our lives and they mark all of our lives, there will come a day when this reproach is removed forever. There will be no guilt in heaven. There will be no sadness in heaven because the reproach of sin will be removed. And this is a great cause for rejoicing. He will make us new inside and out. I don't know how you've been touched by these things. Those of you that are young, perhaps not so much yet. 
But every person here that has many years in your life, you have been touched by these things, either greatly touched by the pain and the fear of death or by the reproach of sin. And the idea of one day being done with these things offers great hope. And this is the hope of the salvation of the Lord our God, that one day these things will be done away with. And this was not uncommon to this day. You need to understand people were the same back then as they are today. And they needed to hear this good news just like we need to hear this good news. But as it says in verse 9, they were waiting. They were waiting for this coming in the future. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. On that day, that day, whether it be for them, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. It's hard for me not to shift gears because I want to talk about where we are now. But where, where they were back then, they were waiting for this Messiah to come waiting for him to show himself that he might save us. It's very important to see that these people were not trying to work their own salvation. They were waiting for the salvation of God to come to them. And this is radically important because there are many people that will tell you in this day and age that the salvation of God is your best life now. But let me tell you very clearly, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the salvation of God is not about what the Lord is doing in your life right now. It is about what he is beginning now and what he will complete in the future. It is about eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That he is working out salvation for us that we might receive it and worship and exalt him, rejoice and be glad. We wait upon him that he might save us, and then we will rejoice in his salvation. The rest of the verses here, 10 through 12, have to do with the future putting down of the enemies of God. But for the sake of time this morning, I want us to shift to the New Testament to see the clear fulfilling of these things. A passage that it, it must be connected together with Isaiah chapter 25 that you might see and know the richness of it. I would ask you as you keep a finger here in Isaiah chapter 25 to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 and following. These are verses that we don't often read unless uh, we're at a funeral. And it's very important that we read these verses not at a funeral so that we can speak about them more clearly. These verses, as we'll see at the end, culminate in what we see here in Isaiah chapter 25, the swallowing up of death forever. That the beginning of this uh, fulfillment of these verses is Christ Jesus in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 says this, But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Let's go back and look at this and see the strong parallels from what Isaiah is speaking that will come to pass, what comes to pass in Christ in his ministry, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and what is yet to come to pass in his second coming, judgment, and eternity. So in verse 29, Christ has been the first to be raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus is the first to ever overcome death, to raise from the dead and never to die again. Lazarus died again. Jairus' daughter died again. Jesus Christ is the only one to ever 
overcome death in his own power and never die again. This is why the ascension of Christ, that doctrine, that recording in scripture is so important that Jesus is not dead. He is seated in heaven at the right hand of God the Father that he might extend his life to you and to me that we might live forever in him. But there is an ordering to these things and an explanation to these things that is important. For death has come into the world by Adam. He comes, he and Eve, in their rebellion against the Lord God. Sin enters into the world and death with sin. And that curse, that veil, that covering which is over all the world continues down to our day and age. We very much feel the effects of sin and death in the world. And the question is, how will these things ever be reversed? How can the great flood tide of sin and death in this world ever be reversed? Well, it begins its reversal in Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first to come back and to overcome death that he might then give his life to others. And it begins a period of reversal that will one day be fully consummated in the kingdom of God and in his second coming. But what is very similar to what we see in Isaiah 25 is this idea that the Lord must overcome all of his enemies. There must be a ruling of God, a power of the Lord displayed against evil that ends in their condemnation. It's the same thing that we see in these chapters of condemnation in Isaiah 13 through 24, ending in what we read in chapter 25, verses 2 and 3. And we see Paul saying the same thing here in verse 24. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He will reign until all the nations of the world know that the Lord God is God. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God to the glory of God the Father. And I believe very much this idea of every knee bowing is not every knee gladly bowing. Some knees will be made to bow, but they will bow and they will give glory to God. And the last enemy that will be finally and ultimately ultimately destroyed is death itself. If you'll remember from last week, I spoke about Satan having the power of death. When Satan is fully and finally defeated, death will be defeated with him and there will only be life for those who are in Christ. This picture of a feast and of joy together and gladness and hope, this is what eternity in Christ is for us. Not that we will be at a table forever, but it is a picture of the joy to come in heaven, in gladness together with our Savior. From the time of Isaiah to the time of Christ, the Lord of hosts is subjecting nation after nation to himself, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. And then in Christ is the inauguration of the kingdom of God, that in Christ he overcomes death by faith, believing in and waiting on the salvation of God. This is the salvation that we are looking toward. I want us to continue as we look at verses 50 through the end of this chapter. Verse 50 says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit I'm sorry, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's Isaiah 25, verse 8. 
O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's go back and look at this. Flesh and blood will not enter into the kingdom of God. This is the exact same concept that Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. That those who are only born in the flesh, those of us that just live an everyday secular life, you're not going to transition into the spiritual kingdom of God. There must be a spiritual change. The salvation that is coming to us in Christ begins in the salvation of the soul and works its way out into everything else. The imperishable, the perishable, excuse me, must become the imperishable. That which is mortal must become immortal. There must be a spiritual change that only the Lord God can bring. Death will swallow us up unless it is swallowed up by someone else and life is given to us. We do not have the power to overcome death. And I want you to take these things very seriously. Our day and age is good at ignoring death. It's amazing to me. Every single one of us here will die unless the Lord Jesus returns before we die. But so often we we turn away from it. Even when we go to, they don't call them funerals anymore. They call them celebrations of life. And I know that sounds nice, but for the unbeliever, what that normally is, is we're only going to focus on what they did in the past Because we don't want to talk about where they may be or what may be happening to them now. So we're just going to ignore that part. And and if it's if it gets uncomfortable, we're just kind of kind of be uncomfortable, then we're going to walk away and just act like nothing happened. And that's not okay. Because the scriptures are abundantly clear that you have a soul and there is a God, and that there will be life after death. You will either go on existing forever in punishment or you will go on existing forever in the Lord. And the free grace of Jesus Christ is that you might be saved, not by your own works, but by the finished work of Christ on the cross. And this available to every man, woman, and child, if you will believe in Christ as your Savior. And so we must not, we cannot ignore the reality of death. We must look death squarely in the face and then hope in the salvation of Jesus Christ. If you were to go out from here today and go to the doctor's office and they gave you an unexpected diagnosis of six months to live, what would you do with that? Don't think this is unheard of. It happens all the time. People go to the doctor and they get a diagnosis of something they didn't realize and they don't know what to do with it. And so often they strive away those last six months just trying to hang on to the things of this world which will be lost. I am encouraging you to look beyond these things as Isaiah was bringing the word of the Lord to his people to look beyond their present circumstances to eternal things to come that you might live in this same way. That you might look to beyond the perishable and mortal things of this world to the salvation of Jesus Christ, the reality of his resurrection and that one day the trumpet will sound as it says in verse 52. It is a beautiful, do some homework on that. Where did the trumpet enter in? The trumpet entered in in the tabernacle and the Lord gave specific directions to, to, to build some silver trumpets and the trumpets were used to call the people to worship all throughout the Old Testament during the time of the temple and it will be so when Jesus comes again. The trumpet will sound to call us together to worship the Lord our God in his kingdom forever. And in this, death will be swallowed up And the second quotation is from Hosea, chapter 13, verse 14. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Death will have no victory in the life of the Christian because Christ Jesus has won the victory. We will live even though we die. So our closing words are from verse 58. What should we do? How should we live in light of Isaiah chapter 25? How should we live in light of the resurrection of Jesus and his ministry and his, the hope of his second coming? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 
Let us be immovable. Let our faith and hope of Christ Jesus be steady and strong and unwavering. Let us go out and live for him every day, knowing that our labor is not in vain, knowing that we will one day enter into the salvation of God, and this is our hope, our undying hope. And in this, our feet are steadfastly upon the rock of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the the word of the Lord come to Isaiah so many thousands of years ago. That one day death would be swallowed up. And we are in the privileged place of having the testimony of eyewitnesses who speak of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That you have sent your son to be the savior of the world. And that he has indeed risen from the dead. And that we are commanded by him to go out and bear witness to these things. That the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. It has begun. And it will never end. And Lord, this morning in hope, just as your people in the Old Testament waited for your salvation to come and the Messiah, we wait for the second coming of Christ this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen our hope. That our hope would be steadfast in you, immovable. That we would abound in the work of the Lord each and every day. We love you, Jesus, and we pray for your work in our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.